Okay, welcome to another episode of Inside the Kennel Podcast. What are we up to, Manny? Is this the fifth, maybe? Or I've lost, I've lost track. It seems to be going on forever. But again, this episode, we've got a we've got a couple of fantastic guests, and we've got the great man himself. He's very generous with his time, Dougie Hawkins. Take it, take it over, Matty. What, what's going to go? What's going on? Well, we have got Simon Beasley um, today. You know the uh, the nineteen eighties pinup boy. I think he was. Uh, it would have been a bit of a tug of war between Simon and you, Doug, for the in terms of the popularity contest uh, of the eighties. But my gosh, what a player! No, he was Matty. Paul, he was an absolute sensational player, and you know just the the ability that he that he had. I mean, when, when people talk about Simon Beasley, they say, "Oh, um, you know, he, he, he had the blonde hair and the white skin, <laughs> white skin, and he he arrived at the Bulldogs in a." pinstripe suit and a Mercedes Benz or something like that or a BMW and I thought to myself, he ain't going to make it either, this bloke. (laughs) He won't make it with us, this bloke. And right from the start, right from the start, he fitted in beautifully. He was just, um, as a bloke, he was just fantastic to talk to and and to get along with and to play uh, in front of as a winger, to have a bloke like him and obviously, you know, a bloke like Calvin Templeton and Simon Beasley, um, Makes your job a lot easier, let me tell you. You just so what, Dougie, out in front. a boy from the bush when I used to watch him play. Yeah. Um, one of the things I know from our area who got drafted, or in those days they were zoned, they'd often be tradies, they wouldn't be particularly good at school, just really good at sport. As a kid, I noticed that Beasley was Simon was just he was an intelligent bloke, he was a stockbroker. That yeah. seems to be advertised a fair bit. Yeah. And there was another bloke, Stephen Smith, he was a lawyer at Melbourne who were very good players. And I yeah, remember yeah. just thinking, ah, oh, you, you can be. You can go to university and be smart and be an AFL footballer. Sort of a, he broke that ground from that point of view. Paul, he certainly did, and 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 Matty, he, he had great courage. You know, he, he ran straight at the footy. He never shirked an issue. Uh, he ran straight at the football. He had fantastic hands. Um, he was probably better kicked for goal from a distance. Mm. I found him, you know, 60, 65 metres out. I'd be more comfortable than him being 15 or 20, if that makes any sense. And he's still a very nice kick in close for goal. But when Pyman, when Pyman had the ball deep outside, you know, 50 and that, I was really comfortable about the ball, you know, kicking a goal. And uh, I think when he kicked his hundreds, two boys in 1985, it was a semi-final against North Melbourne. We'd got absolutely belted in the qualifying by Hawthorne by about 90 points. And we had to regroup and bounce back against North Melbourne. And Simon kicked his 100th that day. Uh, and it was a magnificent mark too, by the way. And I remember it clearly. He, was, he backed back into the pack and stood his ground. He got absolutely smashed and crunched. And just I remember him just standing there, the ball in his hands. And, and he went back and kicked his 100th goal. Um, yeah, he, he's an amazing player, Simon. And again, a lot of people outside the kennel don't give this bloke enough credit. And, and I'll say this again, and I'll sound like a broken record. Simon Boos is a champion player. Yeah. Dougie, how did he fit into the culture of the Bulldogs? Like you said just before, he wasn't your typical type of maybe yeah, Bulldog yeah. Uh, profile. So I guess he won the fans over pretty quickly with his outstanding results. But how did he did he merge into the club all right with your, with your tradie, your young plumber who may be playing at the club? He, he had this... He had this um, a likable character, you know, outside of him being, you know, as you said, Paul, in the, in the, in the, you know, the intelligent and smart and clever. Uh, outside that, he just had that bit of cheekiness about him as well. And he, he, he could go to the line, the fine line that could stir you up, uh, stir you up. And he knew when not to go over that line, if that makes any sense with the playing group. Oh. He could just have that, you know, bit of, bit of banter, a bit of crap that we, we, we talk about. And he, he just knew when to pull up and when to step back. He was a very, very smart judge uh, in that area. And, um, and and when he came to the club, or you know, you obviously had Calvin Templeton. So it was the two twin towers. And I remember oh, yeah, Dad yeah. speaking to me as a young kid saying, the worm's going to turn here because we, we had a pretty flat patch in the early 80s. And then suddenly we had these two targets. Did that work out, having Calvin and Simon? 
Yeah, I, I don't know how long Matt, they had together. I, I think it might have been only a, a year or two because I, I can recall so, uh, uh, Calvin hurting his knee. Hmm. And I reckon he left the Bulldogs at the end of 1982 and he went to Melbourne. I reckon Peter Moore might have been, obviously, from Collingwood, went to Melbourne as well, where Moore won a Brownlow medal. And Calvin did his knee in a night game out at Waverley and he was never able to be the same player. Uh, so to have Beasley and Templeton for that short period, it was just, oh, wow. if one wasn't going to get it, the other bloke was going to get it as well. And and I remember Simon, he, he might have kicked um, double figures. Oh, he, he kicked double figures many a times. I reckon against Richmond, he kicked 12, three or four times against Richmond. For whatever reason, he loved playing Richmond, the pieman. Dougie, do you remember his first game? We, he played on Ronnie Andrews. Can you remember that <laughs> night? Ronnie Andrews touched him up. Now, if you talk about opposites, Ronnie Andrews was a big shooter. Again, a bit like how Simon got the press around being uh, in the stockbroker. Ronnie Andrews seemed to have a photo with a gun and a dead, <laughs> a dead pig. <laughs> it would have been a delightful matchup. He would have scared the crap out of him, Paul. He would have, he would have scared the crap out of Pyman Finnegan. He would have walked up and he said, how you going, Simon? Uh, I'm going to knock your head off today. That's right. Simon would have went, oh, here we go. This is this is going to be fantastic. If I don't get you, Peter's crackers, Keenan's going to get you anyway. So that's right. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't no, want to, he was, Ronnie, I mean, we could do a whole show yeah, on that's Andrews, right. but yeah. what a, what a, he was a fascinating player, wasn't he? Very tough, but... Uh, I mean, we're very interested to ask Simon how his first game went. Yeah, 100%, Paul. And, you know, and again, uh, you know, all the foot... You're right, Matty, you hit, hit it on the head. He's very popular with supporters. You know, I mean, I was, I was one of the, I was the Western Suburbs. I was a Braybrook boy. I was one of their favourite sons. But he came along with the likes of Brad Hardy in his first year in 85 and, and took the footy club and the supporters by storm. Yeah. Beasley was very well loved by the Western Bulldogs Footscray supporter group. Well, you, well loved. You, you describe him as you know his, his his pale skin and his blonde hair. You could see him, you know, if I was if I was at the Barclay Street end and he was at the Geelong Road end, yeah. you could just see him like a beacon. And you know, when he's leading out to you on you know, on a lead, he just stood out. Yeah, and, and Matty and Paul, what we got to remember, he, he was he was very um, genuine, very genuine and very genuine sort of bloke. And he spent a lot of time with a, a lady supporter called Nola Sirwood, who just only passed away a couple of weeks ago. It was 92, 93 years of age. And she was just loved the Bulldogs, her and her husband, Harry. And Simon Beasley treated her, Nola, like his mum. He was fantastic. He was taking the footy all the time. This is when footy, when he's finished, uh, he'd just done so much for this lady, uh, Nola. And uh, um, he just he's a, just a fantastic, fantastic human being, Simon Beasley. Oh, thanks for mentioning Doug, he had a great run of games too. If you look at how many he played, I mean, I think for the first season, one season he might have played 12 or 8 or something, but yeah. mostly fulfilled his obligations playing every year. Pretty injury-proof, Paul, it, it really, because, again, I'll say it again, guys, he, he ran straight at the footy. He never shirked an issue, and uh, uh, and he was. He's very durable. His body, he was very, yeah, he's very strong. Like, he was very lean and, and very wiry type of player. But he was very strong. And again, he had that good one grab. Um, the footy, just one grab. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, I also just want to quickly ask you as well, Doug, um, about a match that he played in Carrara. Um, <laughs> so uh, you probably remember the match I'm talking about. He took yeah. a mark right on the siren. And um, it was a phenomenal um, game. But he, had, he actually had to have a shot after the, after the siren to win the game. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. And I, re I reckon on the mark, uh, the Brisbane Bears it was, they had a player on someone's shoulders. I reckon the bloke on the mark had a player on his shoulder at one stage. And and I, I think Pyman missed that. He kicked the point. But the other one, Matty and Paul, which I know you're going to touch on, was 1984 when we beat Collingwood. He, and he backed back and took that mark in front of uh, Greg Phillips. Yeah. I, oh. I got a feeling it was uh, Graham Allen kicking the ball across goal. Guppy did it, yep. Gubby Allen, and, he, and he's gone back and taken that mark. Uh, and as he's come in to kick, the siren's gone. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I think from memory, um, Jim Edmund let uh, Gubby know a little bit about it as well. <laughs> he did, Jimmy. Did, Emma did let him know. He got the old... <laughs> I'm glad that, you're doing all this research for us, Dougie, because we'll ask him these questions without a doubt. Yeah, Paul, no, he... he um, 
Yeah, I remember that 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 one at one of the '84 game because it was an arm wrestle. Uh, Collingwood, we it was just goal for goal, and um, and for Palmer to go back and take that grab, um, and then to go back and kick the goal was just fantastic. Um, terrific it was. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Doug, we are going to welcome Simon in right now. Um, but any final words um, just in regard to Simon and, and in your connection? Because as a midfielder, um, you know, I guess you get to have a front row seat. And um, I guess it's, you know, it, it's not only down to the forward. It's, it's some of the, about the delivery. Now, did you have a particularly good connection with Simon? Yeah, I did, Matty. Um, I just, I had the, the, I had the, I just knew that I didn't need to kick the ball hard. You know, some players kick the ball hard to a, a leading forward. I'd put the ball out in front of him where he was going to be in his next five or six steps and he'd run into the footy and he just had that great ability to, to mark one-on-one. Um, so we had we had a great understanding. We had a super understanding, me and Beza. And, and again, um, boys, I'll say it again, outside the kennel, a, a lot of people wouldn't say that he was an out-and-out champion. I'll tell you what, he certainly was. And he wasn't far behind the great Calvin Templeton. They were very, very close. Wow. Very, very close. That's awesome. Well, you know, I remember fondly being, a, you know, a kid in the playground and just jumping on people's backs. So I think some people have still got injuries to their spines to this day from from me jumping on and screaming out Beezer and trying to take a hanger. You know, he was just an inspiring player. So um, thanks so much, Dougie the Kennel Master. Champion, Matty. The champion, Paul. Simple as that, please. Run your Dougie. The champion. Awesome. All right. Okay, Doggy fans, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you all uh, the Footscray, Footscray Bulldogs icon and legend, Simon Beasley. Welcome, Simon, to the show. Thanks very much, Paul. Nice to be on, mate. Very nice to talk to you guys, yeah? Absolutely, Simon. And um, look, we're really uh, delighted to have you on. You're a 157-game veteran, 575 goals. That's um, you know a club record, obviously. You're a seven-time leading goal kicker, in fact. Full forward in the team of the century, um, and a Hall of Famer, of course. So you know, it, you know, you probably have got a, a, a rap sheet there that's longer than most. Um, and I was just interestingly having a, a read of the uh, Footy Almanac. It describes you as a fast leading full forward and one of the most popular personalities of of your era. But uh, I reckon you could possibly do better than that. For people who are Googling your name and never got to see you play, how would you describe yourself, Simon? Um, interesting question. Look, I was, I was never blessed with talent when I was at school, so I struggled a bit at school. And, and then I grew, you know, I grew really quick. I, 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 um, I came from Perth and I went to uh, uh, Guildford Grammar School and I was a bit of a bit of a nerd in terms of footy, ability and everything. But all of a sudden, I went to university and started hitting my straps and uh, putting on a bit of weight and things came together for me. You know, it was interesting how the development took place. Yeah, wow. Because, you know, having a look, and you're a numbers man, you probably know this, in the 1980s was the most prolific decade in footy history for in terms of goal scoring. Um, and, you know, you, you look at that era, you've got, you know, the great Tony Lockett, Warwick Kappa, um, Dunstall, Gary Ablett Sr. But there's one man who tops that in terms of goals, goals scored in the 80s. You know that person. So how does that sit with you, Simon? You're at the top of the tree. Yeah, yeah it was interesting because my, my career sort of straddled the 80s. Um, I came over from Swan Districts in 81. So I played with the Bulldogs 82 to 89. And, um, and it was interesting because I, I kicked just shy of 300 goals at Swan Districts. And, of course, in those days, the competition was... Um, well, it was not national. It was just state by state. And uh, anyway, I kicked a few um, a few goals at Swan Districts and then came over and things sort of, things were tough for me early days with the Bulldogs. I struggled early, but managed to get my mojo going after a, uh, a few games in 82. Simon, you were one of, the, you were one of two players to have kicked, and I'm sure you know this, a century of goals in each state, Victoria, the VFL and the Waffle. Were you aware of that? Yeah, I kicked a century in the Waffle. Um, it was in 1980, and we played off with the flag that year, got beaten thoroughly in the grand final. Um, and Warren Ralph, who actually eventually went to Carlton, he was playing at Claremont 
in the early 80s, and he also kicked a century in that year. It was quite incredible. So it was interesting. But And being able to do it over here was great. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a great thing. I mean, at the time, it was quite interesting because it seemed to be a common play occurrence. You know, a lot of blokes kicked 100 goals. You didn't really think a hell of a lot about it because it was happening so much. But now um, it's it's rare. It's rare. And whether or not we see another full forward kick 100 goals is problematical, I would say maybe doubtful. The way the game's played. Mm. We were we were just quickly discussing before you came on, Simon. Back in that era, there were great full forwards, and then we were uh, thinking there were also great full backs, of course. Well, the full backs were prolific. You know, um, I started my as I said in '82, my first year here, and uh, I was up against blokes like Gary Malarkey from um, from Geelong. I had Kelvin Moore, Kelvin Moore from Hawthorne. I uh, was a formidable opponent. I had uh, I had Jeff Southby and Bruce Stool from Carlton. Um, look, there were many very there were many good fullbacks in that era. Um, so, and also, I mean, the interesting thing was that we used to watch watch the VFL games in Perth on the winners. The winners was the most watched game, the watched hour of football every week on a Sunday night, six pm. It was incredible, and so we we loved watching the VFL. And all of a sudden. I, I, I entered the BFL um, age 25, and it was uh, it was quite an experience. Yeah, with um, with some of those full backs at the time, you know, I guess full forwards and full backs have the pleasure of not always being, you know, in the thick of the action. So I guess there's an opportunity there for some banter and some discussion. Were there any players in particular that um, you know that were big on the chatter? So look. Another bloke I failed to mention him who's a very underrated fullback and he played in excess of 300 games is Rod Carter. Yes. So he went from Fitzroy to the Swans and had an incredible career, Rod Carter. Um, but look, in, in terms of banter, you know, the, the game was still pretty quick in the 80s. Uh, he didn't really get, a, get a, much of a chance to talk, you know. You were sort of always under the pump in a way. Um we did get a, th- a few thrash- thrashings early, um, but you were sort of always on the move and your concentration was always on the game at hand and even, you know, the ball across half back your half-back line. I tell you what, it could come in really quick. And, I mean, we had great ball deliverers. Yes. I didn't really get to know a, know a lot of the players um, who were playing on me at full-back particularly well. Let's, Simon, let's go back to, to Perth. There's a... I mean, you came over your 25. That's a very mature age for a footballer, so you were ready to fire. Who were your influences? Where did you get your height from? Where did you get your pedigree from as far as your football background? So when I – when um, my dad wasn't a tall man. My grandfather's reasonably tall, so I ended up at about six four and a half, six five. But I did grow – I had a growth spurt in about age sort of 17 and 18, 17, 18 and 19. So in Perth in the um, 70s, you'd leave school age 17. So in Victoria, it's always been the year you turned 18. So the year I turned 17, um, I was born in 1956. I I left school and I had a big growth spurt and I was a big, big streaky kid. Um, And so, but I always sort of had good coordination the coordination was important in terms of speed and everything like that. So as a result of that, I was able to sort of, you know, get away from the fullbacks and and make a bit of a name for myself to a certain extent. So, I mean, I recall when you, I mean, I'm a little younger than yourself, but I recall watching you when you arrived. And one of the things I remember about you was that it was well documented that you, you were an intelligent person. You were a stockbroker, which I felt was unusual coming from Shepherd in, in country Victoria, where a lot of our footballers went to Melbourne and were tradies. Uh, that's sort of how you saw the AFL players, and their job was second to their profession. But I recall articles being written about how you were a, a, a stockbroker, and I can only imagine that took a lot of your time up, and I was always amazed how yourself, and even a player like Stephen Smith, who was another sort of tall, glamorous-looking fellow at Melbourne, was also a, a well-known lawyer, how you manage to sort of balance those two professions, which are both very demanding. Yeah, so the financial markets were of great interest to me. I, I worked with a company called Hartley Point in Perth, which is quite a well-known broking house. And um, coming to Melbourne, I worked 
for a smaller broker, Randall and Cohen, then Ord Manette, which is a bit of an institution in Australia. So I, I sort of combined the two roles of being a professional, well, semi-professional footballer and working in the Stock Exchange in Perth. And I thought I should be able to replicate the same thing in Melbourne. And the, uh, the markets in the late 70s were off the boil a bit and on the nose. And I needed to look at um, opportunities in Melbourne. And a couple of opportunities came up and the Bulldogs presented themselves at the right time. So I was fortunate to be able to get a, a pretty good job in the Stock Exchange working with um, Aud Burnett and also um, playing footy with the Bulldogs. So you would have thought you would have been more aligned to, you know, sort of one of the more affluent clubs or, um, you know, you've come to the, to the deep heart of the working class at Footscray. What was that like for, a, you know... <laughs> A person like yourself coming in and um you know who were the sort of the, the faces that um that sort of stood out in the early days yeah so look i spoke to a number of clubs funnily enough that i i um when i was uh when i was at university i played three years um in the university in the um, amber competition well it's a very strong competition the amateurs in western australia at that time and i played for the U uwa the university of western australia and um and I was lucky. I got I got into the um, I got into the state team, the Western Australian State Amateur Team, and there was a, a carnival at West Torrens Oval called Tebberton Oval in Adelaide. And uh, I got the medal at that carnival. And interestingly enough, um, when I went back to Perth uh, at the conclusion of the carnival, I sort of got started getting approached by um, Western Australian teams and also Victorian teams, and. As a result, um, I spoke to Malcolm Brown, who was coaching um, Claremont at that stage. But I'd always grow, I'd grown up in the Swan Districts area, Basin, near Bassendean Oval as a kid, you know, going to the football with my grandpa on my mother's side. Uh, every, every, every week we'd go to the footy, my grandpa and I. And, and anyway, in 1975, he passed away. And then I had my, I was playing with the amateurs at that stage. And, um, and I, I sort of wanted to try and establish myself in the waffle, the Western Australian Footy League, rather, because I'd spoken to, I, sp I reckon I spoke to Hawthorne, I spoke to the Bulldogs, I spoke to St Kilda, Carlton, um, Geelong, just to name a few of the Victorian based clubs, of which there were 12. Mm. Um, and so I didn't really want to make a decision about coming to Victoria because I, I really didn't want to make an egg of myself in terms of like, you know, I, I didn't know how I would succeed in the waffle if I would succeed in the waffle competition. So I wanted to give myself an opportunity to play with Swan Districts, and then, and 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 then if the opportunity came up to play in the VFL, was which was the um, it was the the epitome in terms of you know West Australian based players. Everyone wanted to play in the VFL. It was sort of a dream if you were able to achieve that uh, this, that status, and that happened with me. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you walk into the to Witten Oval for the first time, or the Western Oval. Uh, did you say, "Oh wow, where have I landed here?" Or was it uh, were they welcoming? Look, it was. It, they were fantastic. But look, I did get criticised a bit in Western Australia because most Western Australians, I mean, people with memories in the late seventies, early eighties, they went to clubs, you know, the upmarket clubs. They went to Carlton, they went to Essendon, um, they went to Collingwood. Um, they didn't really go to a club like the Bulldogs. Mm. Um, but look, I, 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 I loved my time at the Bulldogs. And when I arrived there, um, you know, the guys like Dougie Hawkins and, you know, Terry Wheeler and Kelvin Templeton, it, re it really was just an extension of my career in Western Australia to a certain extent. So all the guys were young, like me. Um, they were great to be involved with. Um, the Western Oval, of course, being out in the Western suburbs, that was a bit of a challenge driving from the Stock Exchange, finding my way out there initially. <laughs> Across um, the river. Look, it was, it was good. It was really good. And, um, and, I, and I loved my time there. Simon, uh, for, for the listeners who, who, who don't understand or uh, went around pre-national competition, what was the whole Waffle or Crow Eaters, Victoria rivalry like were, were, were western australia proud to see their finest go over and play vfl or did they not want you to go i know that barry cable and and uh, polly farmer for example sort of made the pathway there and were great revered players what was it like for the listeners who don't understand what was the difference like between the two were you afraid of failing was that a, was that a added pressure um look the waffle the western australian national footy league competition was underrated 
at the time that I was ready, get to, getting ready to move, they were we have a state of origin game every year, and so the state of origin game was sort of would show you actually how the waffle competition lined up lined up against the VFL. I mean, there's no question the VFL was far superior than the waffle competition. You know, the best players in Australia were playing over here, um, but. The Waffle competition did produce some great players. I mean, Stephen Michael was possibly the greatest player, one of the greatest players to ever play in Western Australia, but he never made it over to Victoria. Uh, but he was an incredible ruckman playing for South Fremantle under Malcolm Brown. And so, so to that extent, um, once, the, once the state of origin thing came in, I think a lot of the VFL teams looked very seriously at a lot of the Western Australian players, and there are more opportunities for us to to find a way across to Victoria. Yeah, I don't think there's any question about that. Yeah. Terrific. We want to ask you a little bit about your first game as well. Um, you, you said you struggled early on to sort of, I'm not sure if you mean to adjust to VFL and the, the difference, um, but how was it, um, you know, in, I guess in that pre-season when you came across in 82 and in, in the lead up to your, uh, your first Guernsey? Yeah, so uh, Royce Hart was the senior coach. And um, the Bulldogs, the Bulldogs' record in eighty eighty one wasn't great. We we had a hell of a lot more losses than wins. Um, so Kelp Appleton was centre half forward, and you know I had they marked me for the full forward position. So in a way that the, the press in Melbourne sort of built me up, being part of Melbourne Beasley, uh, the Templeton Beasley sort of saviour for the Bulldogs. So anyway. <laughs> So, look, when I got here, you know, I, I made mates really quickly. I'm that sort of person to get on well with people. And um, we had our first game out at Windy Hill, actually. Um, I'd never been to Windy Hill. Never, ever been to Windy Hill, even to look at a game or play a game or anything. So I got out there and um, I was playing on Ronnie Andrews. He was full back and I was full forward. And I didn't know much about him, but I'd read a little bit about him because Doug Hawkins was mates with him. They used to have pig shooting sort of thing. And, <laughs> That was foreign territory for me. So I said to Hawk, I said, what do you think about him? He, and, and Doug said, well, look, just keep leading and don't let him get near you because if he gets hold of you, he'll knock your head off and you'll be in real trouble. <laughs> and what happened, we, it was an da absolute disaster for us, the game, because um, we, I reckon we got beaten. It might have been in excess of 100 points. It was a nightmare. And I reckon I hadn't touched the game, the ball in the first half. And I can remember... At the, the forward end, where opposite to where the grandstands were, I was dead deep down in the forward pocket, and I remember getting the ball deep on the on the, the boundary line, and just turning around, and remember vaguely big big Ronnie coming in with his arm up, and he got me a beauty right across the head, and I sort of went down, and I thought to myself going down, I think, what the hell am I doing over here? This is a nightmare. This whole bloody nightmare. So. <laughs> They really crushed us yesterday in that day. It was incredible, really. So afterwards, I was a bit embarrassed, really. I reckon I got maybe one kick, touched it once or twice. And um, it was back to uh, back to square one for me in terms of um, the Bulldogs. But it was a pretty a pretty tough initiation, I must admit. One point Ronnie, to the big shooter. There was many an, article, there's many an article about Ronnie Andrews and a photo of him shooting pigs more than once. And I think that... Uh, that matchup. I, the other question I had to ask for you as well, Simon, did you feel that Victorians in general wanted you to fail? They wanted these imports to fail because they were very protective of their game. So I think that that matchup with Ronnie Andrews, who's a local country boy, probably would have been a great blessing for a lot of supporters. Well, you know, I, I, I was sort of, you know, because we got so pulverised by them and they were so dominant, I thought to myself, you know, this Victorian football caper might be a bit bit too tough for me but look I think with footy and everything you just got to hang in there and it, the VFL the, the the level of the, uh, the the teams are so good in the VFL and I just thought to myself look I'll just hang in there I've got a, I got a phone call after the first two or three games because we got hit very hard the first two or three games the president of Swan Districts who's a great mate of mine and he said to me look we'll always support you over here we know you're having a tough time over there but when you want to come home anytime you can come home his name's John Cooper. And I said, no, Coops, I'm not coming home. I've got a good job in the stock exchange. I ain't coming anywhere, mate. I'm staying right here. So, look, I mean, tough times like that, they test you. And I think 
if you come out at the other end better off for it, that's the way you got to you got to get stuck into things. So, so we ended up doing that. I mean, Collingwood, we we had Collingwood second up out at the Western Oval. Um, they beat us by two or three goals, but it wasn't a punishing defeat. We 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 acquitted ourselves a lot better. Then we made our way out to Waverley, and we got a couple of beltings. Hawthorne absolutely belted us, um, and we sort of started getting our getting our act together in about round five or six. We played Collingwood, and I and I did turn my form around a bit that day. I think I kicked six or seven that day against Collingwood, and I thought to myself, "Hmm, there's a there's a good chance here." And and the funny thing was, at the end of the towards the end of the season. Um, we were in the bottom three or four, and we had a couple of really good wins. Well, we 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 beat Hawthorne at the Western Oval, we beat Geelong at the Western Oval. We had some really a couple of really good wins, and there was sort of hope in the air for us. And um, and I ended up um, I ended up in the low 80s. I, I ran second in the goal kicking to Malcolm Blight, and we played North Melbourne in that last home and away game. And I think he was two or three in front of me. And I thought oh, I'd be nice to be able to finish on top of the goal kicking in the home and away in my first year. And he ended up kicking about 10 and I kicked three or four. So it wasn't to be, but no, look, it was a tough initiation that first year in 1982 in terms of my, my uh, first year in VFL. It was really tough. Yeah. Tom, what, what was your expectation as a full forward? You talked before it was normal to kick a lot of goals, but what was a disappointing game for you? What, what, what would be a number of goals that, that you had to get that you felt would make you a success for that day? Look, I, I never really had a, a specific target in terms of um, kicking a certain number of goals in a game. I think my average in the VFL um, over the course of my career is up around the sort of 3.7 to 3.9, something in that region. But look, it's more a team, it's a more team orientation fact that, you know, success, it, it's great to have individual success and all players want to have individual success. But, you know, combining that success with the, the success of your teammates at winning games is both basically the bottom line. That's what you want and the success you share that with the supporters and the like. So, um, and so we, we, we went through a tough time in 1982. So Royce Hart lost his job after about uh, four or five games. I think the club sacked him and I didn't get to know Royce, Royce uh, particularly well. Look, he's a good bloke. I knew of his reputation. We everyone watched Royce Hart on the TV in Perth, and he was one of the legends of the um, the Victorian Football League. So, but you know, we sort of stuck at it. The Bulldogs, we stuck at it over the year. And Roy, uh, Bluey Hampshire came in and coached the club for the rest of 1982 um, and in 1983 also. And we, you know, we we stuck to our guns and we started improving a bit. Yeah, well, you know, when I guess Bluey came across, we um we had a a big influx, didn't we, of, um, of fresh blood? And, you know, that included, um, you know, your great mate, Choco Royal and Stevie Wallace and, you know, a number of other players. And I guess, you know, the worm started to turn from that point. Um, I think, in fact, first game of 1983, we may have had about 10 first gamers for the Dogs. So do you recall yeah. that, 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 that period and, and things starting to turn in our favour? Yeah, so we needed an influx of new talent. Um Bluey, Bluey coach in 83 and the club went out and um, got Mick Malthouse to come in as the coach in 84. So Mick was, Mick's first year in 84. So we, we had a pre-season camp before Mick was appointed. Um, Bluey asked me if I'd consider being captain of the club. But look, I said, no, look, I've only been here two years and wow. it wouldn't be right. I mean, some of the guys like um, Jock Edmund, who eventually became captain, who was a very good captain for us, a, a real a courageous competitor. Um, Ricky Kennedy was one, who was a touch younger than Jock. Um, and we had s some pretty good, solid guys there. Kelvin Templeton left the club, I think, for memory in 82, at the end of 82. Kelvin um, started having a few issues with them. Um, he built himself up very heavily, very strong upper body. Um, and then he started having issues with his knees. So he went off to the, he went to play with Melbourne Football Club. And as you say, we started getting a few guys out of there, uh, the Gippsland. That was our region, our area, the Gippsland. And with an influx of um, talent from other clubs, I think from memory, we got uh, Robert Clomp came over from Carlton. We got Phil, uh, Phil Malin came from Carlton. Uh, we got Neil Peart came from Richmond. Um, Tim Jepp came from Richmond. And a number of blokes came from interstate. Andrew Purser, who was a champion ruckman in Eastern Mantle, he came over. Jimmy Sewell, 
Uh, Tony Bahaj, who came from, um, from uh, we've got a couple of um, Indigenous guys, Lally Bamblett. And the year I kicked 100, Lally Bamblett kicked 50. People forget about how good Lally Bamblett was in 1985. He was unbelievable. I um, don't forget, he was incredible that year. Uh, and Dougie was, you know, talking about, you know, how lightning he was. And I guess, you know, he, he had that appendix, um, that burst, and, you know, it probably you know, stopped him in his tracks when he was absolutely flying. He was, he was flying and we were sort of, we were sort of uh, headed in the right direction at that time. And Lully went down with an appendix um, uh, situation and, you know, we, we, we sort of really missed him in the finals. And when he came back, he just wasn't the same player. I think the first two weeks of the finals, we got beaten convincingly by Hawthorne in 85. Then we bounced back against North Melbourne the second week of the finals and we had Hawthorne again. Uh, in the preliminary final, and we only we just missed out. But uh, Lally Bamblett, uh, fully fit, very very difficult player for the opposition to counter, and um, it was a bit of a pity that he wasn't. He, and he went down in that situation. But he was he was a terrific bloke, Lally Bamblett. We loved playing with him, and he he was a great bloke. Fifty goals was a great effort. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I remember oh, Simon uh, saying, oh, "Sorry, go go, sorry, go, Matty." Oh, look, I want to ask you a little bit more about 1985 shortly um, because, you know, it was an incredible year, you know, of all your eight seasons, I guess that was the only only time that, um, you know, you played in finals. Um, so we'll, we'll certainly get to that. But I guess just before we do, um, 1984, you know, there was a, that famous game that you played in at, at Western Oval um, against Collingwood that you've spoken many times about. Um, uh, could you walk us through for the listeners um, just in terms of... Um, Gubby Allen and his um, his decision to sort of kick across the face of goal and your intercept and 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 what ensued there. Yes, yeah, so basically that game against Collingwood at the Western Oval it was a Sunday afternoon, I think, from memory, and it was a pretty tight, willing contest. And Collingwood had sort of three or four goals up going into the start of the last quarter. We'd just be hanging in there, and um, um, we were kicking to the Geelong Road end with the wind in that last quarter, and we. We started to get a bit of momentum up about halfway through the last quarter. We started hitting our straps a bit. And I, saw, I, I felt as though we were a rough chance. Um, and so we got within a few points of them with minutes to go. Um, and there was, there was a free kick awarded deep in the, the right-hand forward pocket, kicking to the Geelong Road end to, um, to Gubby Allen, Graham Allen. And he elected to kick the ball across the goal. So I was on Greg Phillips, who's the father of Aaron Phillips, the last captain of the Adelaide women's football team. And, and I, I thought to myself, I, I, I looked at Gubby Allen, I thought to myself, no, he wouldn't possibly kick it across goals because I knew Greg Phillips had a bit of a dicey knee. Greg always played with a bit of a dicey knee. So anyway, he did. And look, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a miss hit of a, a nine iron or a pitching wedge sort of thing, you know. He just didn't quite, and the wind was fluky. It was always fluky at that Geelong Road end. And the ball held up. It just got caught. And as he kicked it across the goal, I, I backed back quickly and took the mark. But I think the wind certainly helped. And, 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 and it basically fell into my hands. And then history was made when we won, when we won the game. Um, I guess this probably is a really good time to start with speaking a little bit about 1985, Simon. You, you just talked about um, Carlton sort of on their way down. And as it turned out, we played Carlton um, in the first round of 1985, and which ultimately became your most successful year and, you know, one of the Bulldogs' best years for many a decade. Um, can you walk us through how that season started and some of the sort of the highlights that sort of that spring to mind for you? Yeah, so um, in 85, we had um, a pretty solid pre-season under Mick. So it was Mick Malthouse's second season as uh, senior coach. And um, we had quite a few new players came into the ranks. I think Brad Hardy, for instance, who ultimately won the Brownlow medal that year. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head if Andrew Purser had played in 84, but he was certainly there in 85. Yeah, he um, won the best and fairest in 84, Simon. Yep. A Jimmy Sewell, Jimmy Sewell played, um, Neil Peart played. We had a really strong group of guys. So I, I was, because we'd finished off 84 fairly strongly, I think we just missed out on the five, but I was really looking forward to the 85 season. So 
um, it was it was it was an interesting because Princess Park was one of the great you know the, the dens of football you know going to Princess Park and coming up against Carlton and all the supporters and everything was was a real challenge and um and uh, look we we really whipped them to tell you the truth I played on Bruce Dool it was his record breaking game that day he became the Carlton games record holder I think the record went to Craig Bradley years after that but. It's quite interesting because he was, I, I just got him at the tail end of his career. I think for memory, he retired in 1986, but he was such a legend, Bruce Dool. And, um, and, you know, he was, he was one of those players that people all over Australia just admired him for what he achieved. And, and, you know, I mean, I had a day out and they sort of said to the press, the press said to Park and why didn't, why didn't you shift him away from Beasley? Because he's getting towed up. <laughs> the answer to that David Park, because he said, he is Bruce Stool. So I, I thought that was quite a good answer. Um, but um, yeah, the ball was coming in quick, like really quick. And um, I got away from him. I think I kicked eight or nine that day for memory and um, had a bit of a day out. But like, pity they don't have it every Saturday, but th th that's the way it was. No, it was a great, great effort by the team. Um, they came at us a bit in the second half, I reckon, for memory, but we were all over them really. And uh, we're never going to lose the game. It's just one of those really good days. Absolutely. And the, the season just kept on rolling on and we had a lot of success that year. Um, who sort of stood out um, for you and who did you absolutely love being on the end of a, a pass from in that season? Uh, so obviously Dougie, Dougie was the, the most brilliant player I played with in my career. Um, um, he, he, his, his, um, his, his skill level on both sides of the body was incredible, Dougie. And he would get the ball across that half forward, that, that centre line. And, you know, we had a sort of innate understanding in terms of where he would kick it. And he, he could kick it behind me and I could double back and get the ball. I just knew exactly, exactly what to do with him. So he was, he was brilliant in that respect. Um, we had guys like, you know, Stephen McPherson, we had Brad Hardy, who was a great exponent of the skills of the game. We were a very skillful side in 1985, really skillful. Um, Stephen Wallace, uh, we had a lot of very, very good players and, um, and we, we, we were able to put it together. You can remember Tony Bahaja, Alan Daniels was another one. He came over from Claremont, Alan Daniels, I think, from memory. Um, so we had a lot of good players at the Bulldogs and we, were, we did combine extremely well that year. Yeah, absolutely. And we made it, obviously, to the preliminary final and got within 10 points. Um, you know, the week before that was was your, you know, your pinnacle match, I guess, with kicking kicking the big ton. Um, what was that like? Yeah, so the North Melbourne game, because we'd had our pants pulled down the week before by Hawthorne, we were a bit, you know, we were, we were sort of not gun shy, but a bit stunned about the fact that we... We'd, we'd capitulated to Hawthorne to the extent that we did. But Mick was very good in terms of motivating the guys, getting them back on track very quickly, which we did. Um, we went into that Hawthorne game having gotten beaten by St Kilda in the last home and away game down at Moorabbin. And I mean, mm. it's not a place to get beaten by St Kilda at Moorabbin because it, pretty, it was a pretty, pretty tough assignment always down there. But we did bounce back strongly in that North Melbourne game. Um, I kicked six or seven, something in that range. And, and we won pretty convincingly. And that was a great, you know, look, it was a great moment to be able to kick a hundred on the G um, and, and share the success with the other guys. And it was a, it, it was a memorable day for us. And um, yeah, it was really good. Really good. Absolutely. And following, um, you know, that, that week, we got so close to a grand final. Um, you know, Dougie says he, he felt that we might have Essendon's measure had we've gotten through against, against the Hawks. Do you share that sentiment? Yeah, I tend to share it. Um, we did have a very good record against Essendon in 85. That We were one club that did handle them very well. Um, and they held no fears for us, um, even though they were coming up being premiers in 1984. So one bloke I should mention, actually, who I played with the Swan Districts was Leon Baker. So Leon Baker is one of the most interesting um entrances into football at that level because he came to Swan Districts in in 1979 he was playing down at Bunbury he and his girlfriend made the trip across from Perth and they ended up in Bunbury and John Todd the coach of Swan Districts spotted Leon Baker um and he said to me 
he said to me, I got I found a really good player down in Bunbury. I said, Oh, who is it? He said, Oh, Blake with Leon Baker, he's a Victorian, but they haven't picked up on him in Victoria, but he can play. He can really play. So I think Leon Baker's first year was either 79 or 80. So in 1980, we played off for the flag and ba ba Baker was brilliant for us. And um, we got beaten in 1980 and in 81, we played in the preliminary final and got beaten. But I came east in 81. Baker stayed in stayed in Perth. He he played in the premiership, premiership side in 82 and 83 with Swan Districts. He was, interestingly enough, after the 81 premiership, he decided to give away footy in the waffle. And he headed north to go to Darwin to play. And he got up around the Fitzroy Crossing. The flood stopped him. And he headed back down to Perth to do pre-season. And then he played in the premiership side in, in, 80, in 83. Then he came east. And, you know, you can always remember Baker and Paul Weston in that last quarter for Essendon, 84 and 85. Yeah. So he achieved success in both those years. But in 85, there's no question, I reckon, that we did play very well against Essendon. I would have thought Kevin Sheedy would have been quite happy to see us go out um, miss out late in that game. And what, one of the issues was for us, so we, we were 10 points up, I think, halfway through that last quarter. And Lee Matthews, who was one of the greatest competitors of all time, I mean, he came, I think he just burst out of the blocks halfway through that last quarter. And um, Brad Hardy had really sliced him up until then. And um, and he turned the game, I reckon, for memory, for memory, he kicked three to four goals in a, in a five-minute uh, in a five-minute gap, but Matthews did. It was incredible. I was at the other end of the ground. I was watching this unfold, and I thought to myself, my godfather, said, what are we going to do here? And we went from being 10 or 12 points in front to two goals behind, and that was the end of the penny section for us, which is, which is a bit sad because, you know, I reckon we just would have been really competitive the following week against the Bombers, so it wasn't to be. Oh, and when these sort of things happen, you think, look, there's always next year. Um, and that, that next year didn't come for you in terms of finals, and in fact... You know, the decades rolled on before, you yeah. know, we eventually tasted the success. So you've just got to take those opportunities, don't you? And, um, you know, yeah. I, I remember that as a nine-year-old really vividly, that match. Yeah. Look, I mean, you've got to grab your opportunities when they're they're there. And and it's a pretty ruthless game, footy. It's like a lot of sport. You know, you get that one opportunity to see. You, you've got to seize the moment, as they say. So we weren't quite able to do that, but we weren't far away. So, look, I think it gave the club hope. Uh, for the rest of the 80s, it certainly gave the club hope. We, we, we didn't. We certainly didn't rise to the uh, the levels that we achieved in 1985. But I think the club, obviously, you know, they had their issues in the late 80s with the fight back and everything like that. But certainly, 85, as you said, it was a, there was a, it was an opportunity missed. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, Simon, just indulge. This is the question Matty was probably wanting to ask, but who who would have won out of the sixteen premiership team in the eighty five uh, a team? Yeah, it's an interesting question. It's sort of you're talking about a twenty year gap. Football changes so it's changed so much over the last forty years, and different type of game. I think we had a lot of highly skilled players. Um, um, similar to what they had in, nine, in, in 2016. Um, I, know, I know the Hawk says that we would have beaten them if we played them. <laughs> but look, I mean, we had our opportunity. We weren't able to, um, to cement it. They had their opportunity and they did. And you can only do your best at that particular time in the way the game and the, and the era is because footy changes so much every few years. It changes, it changes, it changes. And... Um, and to that extent, I mean, the 2016 side was was really an incredible story for the club, and and they uh, they they served us so well that year. Unfortunately, you know, 21 years prior, we weren't able to do it. But it's one of those things. Um, footy's a game of opportunity, and you just got to grab it when you when you have a chance, and it doesn't come along very often. And that's that's what it's all about. Yeah. Well, I mean, about that time. Um... Swans District, this is a this is something I researched that I wasn't aware of. That they they asked the Bulldogs for fifty thousand uh, dollars for your lease. Can you just sort of uh, extrapolate on, on whether that was true and and what resulted in that? Uh, that was in the mid eighties, was it? I believe so. Yeah, I, I certainly wasn't aware of it. I knew that I knew that I I was under the impression. Because I came to the Bulldogs in 81 under the uh, the old Form 4 system. 
each of the 12 Victorian-based clubs were able to entice two players from interstate and they allocated a Form 4. Each club got two Form 4s and they could they were able to entice two players from interstate clubs and they had to play the club to entice the player a, a fee. So I was under the impression the Bulldogs had paid uh, the Bulldogs had paid Swan Districts 100000 for my signing back in 1982. That was my understanding. I didn't I wasn't aware of any any further any further um, advances that Swan Districts wanted. Maybe they'd gone to Footscray privately and said to Footscray, look, considering the fact that he's played in finals with you guys, we want another fee. But I didn't hear anything about that. Someone mentioned that to me, but I ne it never came to my attention. No. But that never affected your football at all? No, because, look, I when I came in 1982, um, uh, Footscray were very good to me. They were very good to me, but Footscray were technically broke. And a lot of the other BFL clubs, I believe, were in the same boat. Um, and I never really, I never put any pressure on the club in terms of the money's owed because they always asked me if I, if I would mind being paid in, the, um, in the, uh, the first quarter of the following year when membership receipts were, were coming in. But I think right across the board and it obviously it led to the creation of the national competition because the bfl competition as it was structured at that time was going broke um and it needed drastic changes and the the entrance into what became the national the australian football league of interstate clubs was the thing that really made the game so great in our country nice now simon with um, 1985, we obviously had um, great hope moving into the, that next patch, 86, and it just it wasn't to be. You know, we, we'd had a Brownlow medalist. So, you know, it was a huge celebration at the end of 85, um, and then there was, um, I guess, the, the end of season trip that you know became a bit of an infamous one. Was there anything that sort of um, you know destabilised us or, or changed the direction? Because you know, you would have thought that we were um, we were going to be propelled to great heights after you know such such promise. Yeah, so I suppose in a way we became, we were the hunters in 85, became hunted in 1986. Um, yeah, it was, it was interesting, 1986, there was that blue between Mick and Brad. Um, it led to that showdown out at Waverley with the waving of the jumper. Um, yes, look, maybe maybe we just went off the boil for various reasons. I, I, I don't know. It's a... It's a tough one. I know that Mick was pretty frustrated. I think the club was struggling on a number of fronts. Um, and I think basically, you know, the whole club was under pressure. You know, we, you know, there were, there were noises about an alliance with, uh, with Fitzroy. And um, there was talk about that, that did morph into the, the fight back of the, uh, in the 1989 situation. Um, and we generally were a club under big pressure, under big pressure. And I think, you know, the stick of the VFL as it was um, from Jolly Monthouse, they, they, they wanted to see the, the club do a lot better. And I mean, there were clubs lurking from interstate who wanted to be part of the VFL competition, which would become the AFL competition. That was the, that was the bottom line. And, and, and each of the clubs had a license and, and obviously people within, within the, um, the, the, the Footscray Football Club are very, very concerned for our future. Yeah, and I guess, you know, with, with, with the um, the new two clubs coming in, in Brisbane and also West Coast, you know, we, we lost Brad Hardy and we lost, you know, Jim Edmund, but there were other opportunities that came with, you know, the signing of Tony McGuinness. So there were some, you know, big ins and outs there um, and we weren't really sure as a supporter base, you know, where's the, where's the club headed? But um, 1987 brought, you know, Super promise right up until that very last game against Melbourne at, at Western Oval. Do you do you recall that? Yeah, yeah, I did that. And of course, there was a there was a tricky there was a tricky finish to the season because of course Hawthorne um, Hawthorne were playing Geelong down at Cadinia, I think, for memory, and and it was also we were still in that phase of going to the final five and hadn't turned into a, into a final eight. So yeah, that was a disappointing day for us because. We were certainly we certainly went into that game at the Western Oval as favourite, but we couldn't live up to the hype. And you know, and Melbourne went deep into that final that um, 
that 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 final series. So um, um, yeah, and Melbourne, of course, played Hawthorne in that '98. It was 1988 um, grand final, wasn't it? And uh, and and in, in 1987, um, it was Carlton, wasn't it, who crashed uh, crashed Hawthorne at the um, at the G. So look, we we did have opportunities, and we just weren't able to sort of you know put the uh, the cream on the cake, so as to say. But we certainly weren't far away, and I and I and I think we always gave our supporters a, a bit of uh, we gave them hope. Oh yes, a run for their money. Um, 89 was obviously a very disappointing year. I sort of retired the back, back, back half of the season in 89. I had a few knee issues and back issues. Um, I would have loved to have played on with the club, but I just, um, uh, my daughter was, my first daughter was born in 1989 in, in September. And Mary and I got married in, um, in early 1987. So, my, you know, my outlook on life is changing a little bit. I played a lot of footy. I'm at an amateur level in Western Australia and the waffle in Western Australia and then the VFL. So even though my career is relatively short in the Victorian Football League, I had played a lot of footy and I was sort of starting to feel at 33 years of age. I don't know how blokes keep going beyond 33. I can't get my head around it. But anyway, it was it, it, it wasn't to be after that. But when I look back at it now and think about all the friendships I made and the people I played with and the people I've met through football, it's it's the greatest industry of all. There's no there's there's no question about that. So uh so um, you know, I was just so thankful that I was able to be in the right place at the right time and and and, and enjoy playing playing and meeting these foot these people. Uh, Simon, I've I've heard you've had a great relationship with with the Bulldogs fans. One in particular, Nola Sherwell. Is that a yeah. name that's familiar with you? Yes. Yeah, so, Nola Sherwell passed away three weeks ago, um, aged ninety six. She was about a month shy of her ninety seventh birthday. So, Nola Sherwell was and one of the one of our greatest individual supporters. She was a she was a member of the Bulldogs. She was a life member. She was a 93-year-old member and she was the longest serving member of any club in the VFL-AFL history. It's incredible. She became a member of the Bulldogs at three years of age. She, she lived in Kingsville Street, Kingsville, with her husband, Harry, who was the local postman, who was introduced to NOLA by Ted Witten Sr. and Ted's wife. And they never had any children. And um, Harry passed away in 1989 and Harry had a love, love affair with beer and cigarettes and NOLA. And it was incredible because I've been <laughs> in the John, at the bottom of the John Gent stand. You guys would remember, you, you wouldn't have been allowed in there, but they, had, they called it the snake pit. And NOLA befriended me after a game and said, come down and meet Harry. And I met, went down and met Harry. And then Harry passed away a few years later and then NOLA, Came came when, when our first child was born, and my PA picked up Nola and brought her into the hospital. And we said to Nola, "Now, what are you doing at Christmas time?" This is September when um, Nola met George and my my baby daughter, and she said, "I'm not doing anything." No, and so we said, "Okay, well, you better come with us. You're having Christmas with us." So, she, for the next thirty odd Christmases, she, she spent the time with us. But the amazing thing about it was, she was desperate for me to produce a son. So our second child was a, a girl. Emily, and she was into the hospital very early on. And then the third one was a boy. So she said to me after my second child was born as a girl, and she said, any chance you can put a spout on it, which we did with the third one. <laughs> it, was it was an amazing story, Nola, because um, we, uh, we, we, we basically took her into our family. She came to birthdays. Um, she came to all sorts of things. And, you know, people ask me about our relationship with her and, why we became so close to her. And I just said, look, I think Australians generally are like that. They're giving people, they see someone like Nola, she's single, she never had any children, no parents or anything like that. And 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 I think that's a that's, that's a great thing about Australians. They take people in, you know, someone doesn't have anywhere to go for Christmas, you come to us. Hmm. And so she became part of our family. And we we have great stories about Nola. We had her funeral two weeks ago and and um, and we we spoke about her life. We spoke about her life at the Bulldogs, and she she had these little Chihuahua dogs, 
And she used to take them to football every Saturday. Incredible, incredible lady. And unfortunately, she had a fall three or four weeks ago and um, she held on for another couple of weeks But and she passed away eventually. But she had a great life, an incredible life, really. Yeah, well, that, that's wonderful that, you know, you, you've got su such a, a fantastic bond. And, you know, I think a lot of supporters sort of see you, you know, in, in, in such fantastic light um, from all the joy you've brought to us over the years, that's for sure. Um, but just going back to the 1989 point as well, um, you know, you were 33 and you were, you know, sort of coming to the end of your career and the, the club was about to, um, you know, to merge with Fitzroy. You emerged at that time as someone who seemed to be the most pragmatic or calm about it. And, you know, there was a there was a, a moment that you're probably aware of where you spoke to some really passionate, emotional supporters and you were very level-headed about um, the fact that this was going to happen. And, um, and that caused a little bit of conflict between some of the fans who, you know, thought, you know, why aren't you backing it? Um, yeah. Is that how you recall it? Yep. Yeah, that, that was right. Look, I mean, Nick Collum, who is our president, Nick Collum had put a lot of money into the club over the over the journey, and the club was broke. Um, there was no no point, the, no, no question, the club was broke. Um, we'd struggled in '89. Um, I retired, as I said, halfway through 1989, and we were at the crossroads, and the VFL were looking. I mean. Originally, it was going to be Fitzroy, but Fit Fitzroy morphed into the um, the Brisbane Lions, uh, the, the Brisbane Bears. They were at Carrara, right? Um, and the and the club was really at the crossroads, and it, it was the it was the gal galvanizing moment for the club and the supporters. Because I can remember when I retired the following the following weekend after I retired, we played the West Coast at the Western Oval. It was a wet, miserable day, and I went to the president's lunch and I did a lap a lap of the oval and to say goodbye to the Bulldog supporters. And the interesting thing was there are very few of them there. And I'm not criticising them, by, don't get me wrong. Mm. But the club at that stage was dying. And that, that was the reality of it. And it took it took this, this situation, which came about because the, the VFL wanted to go after the club because we most probably had issues, financial issues, and a number of issues. Um, it galvanised the, the, the Bulldog population. And everyone fought back. I, I didn't think we'd be able to. I didn't think we'd be able to. And that's why. But you've got to remember also, Teddy Whitten and Charlie Sutton also sided with Nick Collum right. um, in those meetings. Wow. The people tend to forget that. But what it did was that everyone came out and, and, and together, together they were able to, we were able to fight back and, 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 and give the club breathing space in terms of, in terms of its future. And look, it was just a magnificent effort. And there are so many people at different levels who who helped the Bulldogs survive. And and to, to a certain extent, I would never cast dispersions against anyone who said that the club need to seriously look at that, look at this situation, the alternatives. Otherwise, we might be lost forever. And we were looking at a situation where we may have our licence taken away from us via the Victorian Football League. Um, but people came from everywhere. We raised the money. We got the monkey off our back and and we continued on into the 90s and I think a, a pretty successful decade for us in the 90s. Yeah, well said, Simon. No, thank you for that. Um, can you tell us a few of your highlights? Obviously, you kicked um, 12 goals, 11 goals, 10 goals in multiple games. Were there any of those matches or any others indeed that um, sort of stand out as your kind of your magnificent matches that um, that you look back on really proudly um no not really look i mean it's a it was a big bonus to be able to kick uh kick 10 goals or 11 goals or 12 goals i think i kicked 12 so two or three or four occasions i'm not sure and but they, they those occasions that i did kick goals we we were on fire as a team the bulldogs were on fire as a team there's no question about that um and, you know, to be able to do that, that's good because when you look at it these days, there's not too many of them kick, kick 10, 11 or 12 goals. It's, 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 it's a rare occurrence to a certain extent because, because the game's changed so much. I mean, if I was playing these days, I don't know whether I'd be able to keep up, but full forwards down to the full back position, then he's across to the wing and he's across the other side of the ground. It, it, it's such an athletic type of game these days. It's, it, it, it is very, very different. But look, I had great years at Bulldogs. I'll um, 
I'll, you know, remember them forever. Loved it. Loved all the people, the involvement, different presidents, different players. You know, I I couldn't have asked for any any anything better. And if and if when I came to Victoria in '81, if I if I could have realised just how well it would pan out in terms of the relationships and the supporters and the players and everything, you know, I, I was very very lucky, very lucky, very lucky. Beautiful. Have you um? You talk about it, but you know, and you're very humble. You talk about it as being ultimately a team game, which it is. Have you got some? And it's very hard to say, and you might not want to do it. But um, you know, are there any teammates that sort of, uh, you know, your your top three teammates of all time that sort of jump jump out at you? Well, Dougie Dougie Hawkins was my great mate. You know, at the Bulldogs, I love the Hawk, um, and I've kept in contact with him over the years, um, and he's you know. You know, one of our top two or three players in in, in the club's history, no question. He's he is a great bulldog, Doug Hawkins. Yeah. No no question about that. Um, I've also kept in very close contact with Ricky Kennedy. Um, so Rick's a member of the golf club I'm a member of, and I talk to him on a on a pretty regular basis. I run into folks, Stephen McPherson, um, Stevie Wallace, and the guys from Western Australia. I try and keep in contact with them, Jimmy Sewell. Um, Tony Bahaja, Andrew Purser in particular, who's who's a great old buddy of mine. Um, I don't see Brad so much. I occasionally run into Brad Hardy. But it's interesting when you go through your life, uh, your children are born, then your friends become your children's friends <laughs> go to school and you sort of lose in terms of you try and keep your contacts up in, in terms of your history. But sometimes it is it is it is difficult. But look, um, I was very friendly with Tony Capes when he was president. I became great friends with Nick Collum when he was president of the Bulldogs and he sadly passed away three or four years ago. Um, you know, and those are, those are friendships you treasure forever. But look, I'll be forever indebted to the Bulldogs for the opportunities they gave me, no question. Simon, just before we get on to Maddie's famous quiz that we want you to be involved in, tell us a little bit about the Trevor Barker Foundation that you're on the board of. I think back at the beginning of the 2000s. Can you share yep. about your involvement there? So when when Trevor passed away, and Trevor passed away from cancer, as we all know, and um, I think it was bowel cancer that Trevor had, and we wanted to put together a foundation in memory of Trevor, um, supporting kids with cancer. And so to that end, we raised quite a bit of money and we bought a house down at Torquay, which still stands. Um, and it looks after kids with cancer and they have a breakdown there with their parents. Um, there's obviously a lot, a lot of cancer facilities up here. Um, Peter McCallum, uh, Ronald McDonald House, that sort of thing. But this is a, this is a beautiful place down at Torquay. This gives these kids an opportunity to go down there with the folks who's getting there. It's just fantastic. And so we, we ran functions. Um, we raised money over a period of time and it continues. Um, and to that end, um, I think it was a it was a great thing we we're able to do. So, and so many families in Australia over the period have been either directly or indirectly um, had um, family friends or family themselves who have suffered from cancer. And it's a something that um, you know we all need to, to recognise. Yeah. Fantastic. Were you a friend of Trevor's? What's the, what's the affiliation? Yeah. So Trevor. Trevor, um, Trevor obviously played with St Kilda, and he, Trevor, he was a member of a club that I was a member of, um, and we were raising money, um, and I got to know him quite well through mates of mine at the Bulldogs, who actually came across from St Kilda. So we had actually, interestingly enough, a number of blokes from St Kilda came across the Bulldogs. Um, uh, John Bennett was one, uh, Mark Kellett was another, uh, Con Gorazidis, just the name three. <laughs> So we had quite a few St Kilda blokes came across and that it was regarded as quite a social club, St Kilda. And uh, Mark Keller, the mate of mine I had lunch with today, and we, we often laugh about the fact that um, uh, the Bulldogs and the Saints got, got on very, very well. So, um, yeah, so we had a strong affiliation. As a result, other blokes from St Kilda, a la Barker and the, and the like, we became friendly with them. So I knew Trevor pretty early into my career in the VFL, yep, the early 80s, yep. Wonderful, Simon. Uh, Simon, great story. Now, Maddie, Maddie loves this. This is Maddie's quiz, and I'll hand it over to Maddie. Simon, I hope you, uh, I hope you're ready to go because we've got a, we've got an ascending order of those who have, who have uh, participated, and we hope that maybe uh, it's going to be a little bit like um, Top Gear. If you know what Top Gear is like, where they have the race around the track, Simon. 
Yep. That's very similar. So we want to see where you end up at the end of this. And uh, Matt, you've got some pretty tough questions. So uh, get yourself ready. Okay, no problems. Absolutely. So we always end off the interview with um, with a sixty second quiz. So we, we're going to give you put you in the in the driver's seat, Simon. You can choose one of these two categories, all right? And you'll have sixty seconds on the clock from there. So um, you can select if you'd like to say first game uh, bulldog first gamers, um, or the season nineteen eighty five. Which one takes your fancy? Uh, season nineteen eighty five. I thought you'd say that. All right, fantastic. <laughs> so the sixty seconds on the clock. Best of luck, Simon. Um, your time, sir, starts now. True or false? Phil Mail award number 16 in 1985. True. Uh, he wore 17. Um, Brad Hardy won the 1985 Sutton Medal. True or false? False. Um, the Dogs lost the ribbon to Woody Spooner St Kilda in the final round. Is that true or false? True. Well done. How many goals did um, Simon Beasley kick in 85? 105. Who scored the second most goals? Les Bamblett. Well done. Who was Bri what was Brian Royal's nickname? Choco. How many goals, uh, sorry, how many games did Alistair Ford play that year? Four. One. What number did Andrew Purser have on his back? Um, <laughs> 25. And how many goals were scored the entire match to the Geelong Road end in the game against Hawthorne in round 18? The entire number of goals? Um, 17. And, oh, and I'm just about to start the last question, so you'll get it in here. Which player recruited from Essendon was Maltese? It was Maltese recruited from Essendon. Max Crow? <laughs> It was your good mate, Tony Bahaja. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where right. we end up, where we end up, Matty? What's that, sorry? Where did we end up? How'd he go? Um, I'll add that up, but I, I, I don't think you've passed Dougie, just so you, just so you know. But um, Oh, that's that. I would never want to go past Dougie. Dougie was red hot, Simon. He was red <laughs> hot. He was very competitive. He wanted to win, I can tell you. Oh, that's good. That's good. He's a great mate of mine. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Simon. That was uh, it was wonderful to have you on board. But um, you know, from the bottom of our hearts, you know, you've given us great joy, the Bulldog supporters, and they're going to be delighted to see um, this podcast, no doubt. Nice talking to you and Paul. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Matty. Go the doggies. Red in my heart, white in my veins, blue in my eye, red, white, and blue in my brain. I'm Bulldog Bulldog.